What's it called? It's essentially like what do you think about the games and like whoever answers the fastest thing or like anybody else get next? I like it. I was afraid to see this. So probably I see some, some stragglers coming in, but and then you let us know about the ones online as well. Yes, yeah, I'll them. check it. Okay. Uh, can we get that? Okay. Um, so, guys, I'm going to have you divert your attention. Um, we're going to learn a little bit about the SSOC and the resources they can offer you guys to help you through your learning process here at OSU Location. Yes. Hi, I'm Sam. Um, I'm not occupied to do and where the fourth floor library is. So we're on the second floor and the seminar is in the Yes. Yes. And uh, the lighting lab is just, um, you just get off the elevator on the second floor and they have a separate lighting lab. <clears throat> so we um, just help students on like walk in basis. But the, the lighting center, they prefer that you make appointments that you're ever need. Uh, helping your updating during your period of classes. Um, our, our busiest time for the uh, 27 lab is like during the early and early afternoon. And it gets slower like around four to seven. So if you ever need help, like I'm there until Monday, uh, and then Monday and Wednesday I'm there until nine, and the other days I'm there until six. So any questions on like math or science um, related? Um, I can help you, you know, save time to uh, kind of organize your thoughts and any uh, classes you have. And I don't know if anyone takes math on the time to do. I think I'm going to turn it over to Yolanda. Yes, she, uh, she's an academic success student. Yes. Um, so once again, my name is Shivana Rodriguez. I'm one of two academic success coach. Michaela is one of our academic success coach. Um, so just to um, really emphasize on the center's hours, we're open from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. On Friday, we're open to 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And on Sunday, we're open to 1 to 5 p.m. I do want to emphasize these are the center's hours. They are not the tutor's availability. If you want to access that information, you can go to OSCOKC SSOC webpage. You can go um, to schedule a tutoring session, and it'll show their um, fall schedule. So making sure that you know that specifically. Um, as well as we have overall the Student Success and Opportunity Center for those that haven't gone. Once again, it's in the LRC second floor. It provides essentially anything you would need for academics, including resources, coaching, and tutoring. So some of the resources that we do have include, includes a computer lab. We have over 20 computers that you can use. We have headphones in case you need to listen to any material, as well as free copying and printing. Now, all of our services in general at the SSOC are free. So definitely take advantage. Um, as well as we have a reservable conference room, which essentially, if you have like a study group or if you are involved in a student organization and you need a place to meet on campus, you can book that. As well as we have a reservable testing room. Um, let's say you don't have a quiet place at home, you need somewhere where you can really focus on campus, we have that here as well as we have a lockdown browser installed to that device. So it's really equipped to make sure that you're already used to that testing environment. And yeah, and it's also accommodating for just anyone that might not have lockdown browser on their devices that already has it. So you don't have to worry about it. Now to reserve both the conference room or the um, testing room, you can email okc.tutoring at okstate.edu. 
you can find that same email on our website as well as the business cards that we brought today, um, which you'll have an opportunity after class if you would like to um, come grab that business card as well as we have pop sockets and uh, information we just provide um, in a rack sheet with a QR code. Here right now and grab those cards and the business Definitely, guys. If you wanna, if you wanna grab some of their information, do it uh, before they leave because they're gonna take their stuff with them. So if you want anything like their cards or their sheets with their info, be sure you grab it. There you go. Yeah. Another thing I just wanted to mention about the center is we take up a pretty good chunk of the LRC second floor, so it is a really great place to study um, for both individual and group studying. We have individual couches, group couches. Um, we have a TV that if you want to connect to your computer and you want to see it bigger or like basically prepare yourself for a presentation or anything like that that you can use um, and just making sure that there we are the study place to be on campus essentially. Um, for the writing center, so the writing center is for all subjects as long as it's a writing related assignment. Um, which essentially they can help you throughout the writing process, starting from like brainstorming all the way to like just final proofreading. Um, so really helpful to really get you through that writing process. Um, as well as they have a essay drop-off service, which essentially if you can't make it inside of the center, you can send uh, an email to their business card, which is the same one. I keep on emphasizing okc.tutoring at okc.edu. Um, you can send that over to them and the tutor will make sure they put their notes to give you feedback on your essay that you turn it to the email. Now, for the Writing Center, I know Tim emphasized this, that they um, are walk-in welcome, but it is appointment preferred just to get that one-on-one -on -one, um, when it comes to getting that feedback throughout the writing process. Now, as I mentioned before, I'm an academic success coach as well as Michaela, so we are the coaches here on campus. And essentially what academic success coaching is, is really helping with personalized assistance to really navigate through college. Some of those themes could be like time management, how to organize yourself as a college student, um, how to take tests, how to study, how to take notes, really anything associated to college we can help. Um, we have both 30 minute and one hour increments for coaching sessions, um, as well as both in-person and online. So very accommodating to anyone, to all schedules. Um, same, you can either email the okc.tutoring at okc.edu and we will connect you to a coach, or you can take um, an individual um, coach's uh, business cards. They'll have their direct email. I'm trying to see if I missed anything. I think I touched on all the bases. Well, does anybody have any questions? Well, I hope after this presentation, um, we get to see some of you more at the SSOC, and we're happy to help. Once again, all our services are free, really great place to study, and overall, everyone in the center is happy to help the students. And I'll emphasize, too, um, when they're saying about the services being free, they're free, but you also don't have to, like, apply to the program, or you're already paying for this stuff. It's already in your docket, basically. Do you just need to go make use of it? Um, so if you guys are at all like concerned about like maybe the first exam, you thought you weren't doing so great and you want to amp up your study skills, you're not really sure what to do, they're there to help you, man, and it's free. So go take advantage of it um, as much as you can. And if you guys want to come up here and grab any of the info, I highly encourage it. You might as well. It's one of those things I say, you might as well try it. It's there. It's true. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> I think it has something to do with the lights. That's probably going to turn off because the lights are like Really? I, I think so. Yeah. Like when I turn it off here. That's crazy. <laughs> oh, yeah. I see why y'all like it. I don't yeah. know why you did this. It's part of the reason why I turned the lights off. Yeah. Yeah. I usually have them off. And you can see the, yeah. you can see the projector better. Too. That's true. Yeah. That's, That's crazy. <laughs> Noise. 
Well, thank you guys for coming out again. So guys, be sure you get set up in this uh, Kahoot real quick and then we'll get going. We're playing the game. We're playing one of the games. We're going to do the robot game for it. Just because I only got so much energy left in me right now with this kidney stuff. Right, that's what I keep saying. <laughs> Oh, did you get up your own? Oh. No, no. Okay. It's just me. It's a pretty small section, yeah. yeah. Well, thank Thanks, you guys. And thank you for having us. <laughs> I don't even know how many people are in here right now. 11, that's probably good. Probably the max that we're gonna get. All right, so robot time, guys. You know the drill. Um, be sure to make it to those green squares when the time comes. That's the most stressful part of this one. So it is chapter nine. So if you haven't looked at it, good luck. <laughs> it's not too bad though. This is so long.
Sorry, I forgive you. So good work. Try to crank through this chapter. Um, chapter 10 is my favorite chapter, as I've been warning you guys about. Um, so hopefully you guys like it too. So chapter 10 is going to be dealing with metabolism and metabolism refers to all of the chemical and physical workings going on in a cell or in a body. Um, there's two like breakdowns within metabolism, whether you're going to be breaking bonds or creating bonds, whether you're building things or you're tearing them apart, basically. So if you are making bonds, if you're building things, that's anabolism. You can think of it as like anabolic steroids are literally referring to this. So we're talking about building muscle if you're taking anabolic steroids, right? So that's a, we can usually say, because people have heard of that at least. So if you're going to be building things, you need a lot of energy. So you've got energy input here. Whereas with catabolism, this is breaking down things and breaking uh, bonds to release the energy that was stored in those bonds. Um, and the way I remember that one is if you know of cats and how cats operate, then um, they tend to destroy things, <laughs> break things apart, basically, rip apart your couch or whatever. So cats destroy, therefore breaking down. And when you break something down, it should release the energy that was held in those bonds. That's the idea. Um, so the whole idea of this, it, it revolves around ATP or maybe ATP revolves around it, however you want to look at it. But ATP is our energy molecule. You're either using it or you're making it essentially. And if you are breaking bonds and releasing energy, it'll be either in the form of ATP or as heat, which is why we give off heat as living creatures. 
Um, so in order to make the reactions that are involved in metabolism go, we have catalysts. The catalysts, if you remember from chemistry, those are just things to, that'll help the reaction go. So overcome the activation energy, the energy that is required to push that reaction <laughs> into go. So the thing that we have in nature that acts as our catalyst is the enzyme. Enzymes are a natural way of us dealing with overcoming that, act, that activation energy. So we could uh, be driving our reaction by adding in heat as our energy source. We could be increasing our reactants just to push it along faster, or we can add our catalysts like our enzymes. All right, so um, how are they gonna work? Basically, the thing that they're binding onto and reacting with, so they are not, they're not part of the reaction. I wanna be clear about that. They're not gonna become part of the products. They're not used up. And they can function over and over and over again. They're basically almost like if you were like going to, let's say you're going to uh, the pool with your, your, your kids and they're learning how to swim and the lifeguard or the person that's there teaching them how to swim is there like to help them along or whatever. So it's kind of like that. So um, it's not going to be changed at all by this reaction. It's still going to be there to help the other kids that are coming through um, getting you know taught how to swim. Um, so this could be as simple as, you know, taking a disaccharide, like two sugars that are bound together, which like lactose, lactose is two sugars bound together and breaking it into its parts, which lactose happens to be glucose and galactose is the other one. Anyways, breaking those apart, it could be that simple. And um, so you're, the substrate is the thing that you're holding on to and acting on. And then um, the enzyme is gonna help it get to the product stage without being used up. There's two kinds of enzymes, simple and conjugated, okay? So simple enzymes are just protein and they function just as protein. Conjugated enzymes though, a little bit more complicated, but they're not meant, they make it sound complicated, but it's not really. The whole enzyme that is able to work is called the holo enzyme. Yes, if it sounds similar in this case, it, it is, okay? <laughs> so whole enzyme is the, Holo enzyme. So that whole enzyme that is functional consists of two parts. The protein part, that's the APO enzyme, and then the thing that's helping it. So that's our cofactor. The cofactor can be something like metal ions. That's the most common um, inorganic thing that it would be is a metal ion. Or uh, it could be an organic molecule. Those organic molecules, we call them coenzymes. They're, they're cofactors. They're just organic cofactors. Okay. We call them coenzymes. That could be vitamins. Vitamins are organic molecules, and they are, they are in fact, um, you know, going to be part of this whole play. A lot of times, it's vitamins, and that's a coenzyme. It can be other things too, though. Uh, think of in your red blood cells when you have hemoglobin, right? That's a protein. And in hemoglobin, we have a metal ion, iron, right? And that iron ion. Hemoglobin cannot do its job without that, right? It's not going to carry oxygen without the iron involved in it. So that's an example of something very similar to what's going on in this case that we are familiar with at least. All right, the active site or wherever we're acting on our substrate, the thing that you're working on, that is called the active site or the catalytic site, but I'm really only going to call it the active site. That's where that's going to be binding and that's going to be on the apoenzyme. Okay, so that's always going to be on the actual protein part. And it is a three-dimensional crevice or groove where things are going to be happening. And each enzyme has different primary structure, variation in folding, and unique active site. All three of these. Primary structure, again, that's amino acid sequence, in case we are forgetting. And then the variation in the folding. Um, that's just when we're talking about how it's going to fold up based on that sequence. And then the unique active site. So when we're talking about proteins, we're not just talking about chemical, simple chemical reactions. We learn in chemistry about how, you know, this thing plus this thing makes this thing happen. And these are the chemical reasons for why these electrons exactly doing these things predictably. Proteins are not like that. Proteins don't just rely on maybe, you know, the positive charges or the hydrophobic charges or whatever's going on in that little groove where you're gonna be accepting your little substrate into in your active site. It doesn't just depend on the chemistry of it, but also the shape. Because if the, if the chemistry is there, but the shape of the protein around it changes, 
then the shape is lost and you can't get the structure of your molecule in there. So this is not just dependent on chemistry. It's dependent on shape as well. And that can be changed. And we've already learned a little bit about that with pH and heat, right? Anytime there's hydrogen bonds involved, they can be changed pretty easily. So we've already mentioned a little bit about the metallic cofactors. They can participate directly in the chemical reactions. They can be involved in it, uh, but the protein part will never be changed by it. Now, the coenzymes are just organic cofactors. Um, they'll work with the actual structure of the protein in order to make everything go. They can be involved in transferring hydrogens onto something, moving electrons around, or whatever else. And vitamins typically are a good example of those. When we get into the different classes of the enzymes, there's six different ones that, uh, that there are. There's one of the, two of these I'm not particularly concerned with, you guys know it, but four of these you need to be familiar with, okay? Uh, Oxidoreductases. If this is starting to sound an awful lot like redox reactions or reduction and oxidation and stuff like that, it is. That's why it sounds like that, okay? So here, oxidoreductases are enzymes, they're all enzymes here, ace, ace, ace here, ace here, ace here, ace here, ace here. Remember DNA, polymerase, ace means enzyme, okay? <laughs> so um, we also have dehydrogenase is that are involved in this, but oxidoreductase, that group of enzymes, they're involved in electron transfer. We kind of already know that because we know a little bit about redox reactions. We're going to retouch on them. Don't worry. I'm not going to leave you in the, in the cold out there from not remembering about them. We're going to go just a little bit into them as much as I need you to remember anyways. So transferases, they just move groups from one molecule to another. That's what they do. So maybe taking a phosphate group off of blah, blah, blah over here and moving it onto ADP to make it into ATP. So that's an example there, right? Hydrolases, we're breaking bonds between things. We already talked about those two sugars that we're breaking apart, but you don't just break them apart and they exist, right? You're usually gonna have a hydrogen or something coming in and filling in those blank spots that you left open from those bonds. In the case of hydrolases, when you break the bonds, you're also gonna break water at the same time. H will go on one of them and OH will go on the other one. So that's very common in biology to have that. On the other hand, if you were bringing them together, to build them back together and create the bonds, then you'll be able to take the water back out of it. So those are ligases. So ligases use energy to make bonds. We have to have energy if you're making a bond, right? That's just how it goes. Building things creates, we need energy to build things is what I'm saying. So we have the um, catalyzing formation of bonds. We're putting in a little bit of energy and we're removing water. We're removing water because this is the pretty much the exact opposite of what's going on here. Ligases versus hydrolases. And we've already met one ligase, it's DNA ligase. When DNA ligase came along and sealed together our Okazaki fragments, when DNA ligase came along and sealed our little sticky ends on our uh, stuff. So these guys come back, right? They're important. The other guys are ligases. They deal with double bond stuff and isomerases, which is like shifting structures of these chemicals into like the mirror image format. Those I'm not gonna ask you about, FYI, okay? So oxidoreductases are going to be dealing with oxidation and reduction, yay. So we're back here again. So here's how I remember which one is which. This is my thing that I learned in AP Chem. Leo, the lion says, grr. And there's another one that you guys, if you like it better, you use it, whatever you do you, and that's oil rig. So either one of these, so you do need to know this for this class, okay? It will be on the exam. So loss of electrons is oxidized, whereas G is gain, E is electron, and this is reduced. Okay, so easy enough with Leo. That's what I learned. So that's what I always remember. But if oil rig is what you know, you do you, like I said. So O is oxidized, is loss, and then reduced is gain, right? 
But yes, we are going to have to know that. And as I'm going in through this talk, while I'll be talking about how something is reduced or something, well, I usually just talk about it being reduced. I don't care as much about the oxidized part of it, but it is at some point, just something is being oxidized as well. Because the way that these reactions go, they always are hand in hand, right? You have somebody being reduced, meaning they gain electrons, somebody else had to lose electrons for that to happen, right? So don't forget that. Always have to go hand in hand. They're always in pairs. So one of some of the things that we're going to talk about when we get into this metabolism stuff, we're going to introduce our electron carriers, NAD and FAD. I'm not going to ask you what they stand for, okay? Ever. But you do need to know that they are our coenzyme carriers. And what are they carriers of? They are coenzymes. But what are they carrying for us? Electrons. Okay, so they can carry electrons for us. So when NAD becomes reduced, so remember what reduced means, right? Gain electrons reduced. So when NAD is reduced, it will become NADH. And then FAD, it'll be FAD, and it carries two of them. So here now we're looking at our H's being added on. And we're so used to seeing our H's as protons, not having been associated with electrons. That's why they were protons, they're pluses. So what, how are they carrying electrons now? Well, I mean, normally H's are associated with electrons. When you have methane, CH4, each of those H's associated with an electron. That's why it's making the bond and sharing it with carbon, right? So don't forget, H usually has electrons associated with it. And here we're representing it in this bond, which means it's sharing its electron with somebody. Has to be, that's what covalent bonds are, right? So that's what's happening there. So it's associated with an electron. This is how we're gonna move things around in our, uh, in our whole system, okay? Our electrons. So I'm talking about something being reduced, typically talking about adding on hydrogens that are carrying electrons with them. All right. Y'all ready? Because it's going to happen. Here we go. Uh, exoenzymes. These are enzymes that are outside of the cell doing work outside of the cell, like breaking things down so you can absorb nutrients. Endoenzymes. These are enzymes that are inside of the cell doing work inside of the cell, including all of our metabolic enzymes. And DNA polymerase and things like that. We have enzymes that are constitutive enzymes, and we have enzymes that are regulated enzymes. Think of something that you would always need to have present in the cell, like DNA polymerase or something, you're probably not going to regulate that very much. It's probably going to be around in the same amount no matter what. Whereas regulated ones, you might want to induce them or repress them. Sound familiar? It should. Sounds an awful lot like an operon? Yes. But you can induce or repress individual genes too. Don't forget, operons are going to be multiple genes for our bacteria, right? And it's only bacteria. If you want to just do one gene, you can do that in anybody's cells. It doesn't have to be just bacteria. You can control one gene just fine. If it's got multiple involved, it's called an operon and it's in bacteria. So anyways, this is just depicting what constitutive versus regulated would look like. So no matter what, we have the same number of purple enzyme. Even if you add more substrate in, it's just going to be the same. So on this guy, we start out with very little. We introduce more substrate here, which is our yellow. The purple guy will make more of it to accommodate. Or we can go the other way, inducing and repressing. Let's move on. Um, some of these enzymes are important in disease. They can increase the pathogenicity of an organism. That means the disease-causing aspect of them. If you have something that increases your disease-causing aspect, that thing is called <clears throat> a virulence factor. And it's going to come up a lot in this class, especially in Unit 4. So. These are things that help out uh, with these organisms. Let's look at a couple that sound obvious, like collagenase and penicillinase. Y'all know, you've heard of collagen. Maybe you don't know exactly what it does, but it helps support the structures um, of your like tissues. So it's part of your extracellular matrix and it gives just kind of structure and shape to a lot of what's going on between your cells. Um, if it has an enzyme called collagenase, a bacteria can eat into that with their enzyme, break down your collagen why is that useful for it? Because it helps it get in between your cells and get deeper into the tissues to invade deeper. It can also break down hyaluronic acid, which is part of that as well. Penicillinase kind of gives itself away as well. We're going to break down penicillin. If you are, if you have penicillinase, that's an antibiotic resistance gene. So if you can make that and break down penicillin, you are now resistant to penicillin. Make sense? So you can see how those would help them cause disease. 
We've mentioned denaturation with DNA. You can do that with protein as well. You can denature a protein with heat or with um, pH, just like with the DNA. If you're disrupting those hydrogen bonds, then you're disrupting the structure. A good example of this, of denaturing a protein and then seeing what the damage is that you've done is cooking an egg. If you've ever cracked an egg and cooked it and you know cooked it completely through, can you go back to the original form of it? No, you're stuck, right? Then you, that's because you've denatured those proteins. You've reached the point of no return for those. That's literally what's happening. We're gonna get into some multi-enzyme systems as well. You could be a linear version where just like A goes to B and then the next enzyme helps B go to C and then the next enzyme helps C go to D and et cetera, and et cetera. Or we can be cyclical where you enter U into this madness and then U is gonna combine with something like V, I don't know what's going on in this particular picture, but let's just say they come together, they make something, and then we're gonna shuffle around a whole bunch of bonds and things and whatever. And then you're left over with the same thing that you started with that you can add you back into. That's usually how it goes. So you're starting with some little things that'll come together and then your byproduct will be cycled back into the system. It's very useful and it makes little sense when you look at it at face value, but on the chemical level, it makes sense. I feel like the branch guys also make sense, right? If you're making something or breaking something apart, of course you can go different ways. I don't know. So that place where we are interacting with our molecule, right? That's called as an enzyme, that's called our active site. So if I'm holding my hands, holding this controller is my active site, right? That's where I would be an enzyme holding my substrate at my active site, okay? So let's talk about inhibiting that. We have, uh, the first one was, First one is competitive inhibition. So normally I'm supposed to be doing this with my um, enzyme, with my substrate, but a competitor thing comes in, our inhibitor comes in, looking very similar to it in chemistry and structure, and I bind with that instead. Now this guy can't come in because I'm already involved in this. I can't deal with you. So these inhibitors can take up a majority of your enzymes and even lead to death of your cell. An example coming back to our lovely hemoglobin, which we most of us are at least familiar with on some level, hemoglobin being a protein, of course, that um, has iron in it, and that iron helps you carry the oxygen, and you can bring it to all the different cells in your body that way, in your red blood cells. What if cyanide comes along? Cyanide is a molecule that can bind at that iron spot in the active site, basically, of hemoglobin, and it has a greater affinity than oxygen does. You don't need very much of it because oxygen will never be able to pick it out. It'll be hanging on there like nobody's business. So it takes very little cyanide in order to take the place of what oxygen should. And now we can't bind oxygen into enough of our red cells to keep us alive. And that's how cyanide works. Okay. So that's an example of a competitive inhibitor. We're binding in the place where the other thing should have been. We're competing for that same active site. Competitive. Our non-competitive inhibitor. That's gonna be, normally I'm happy with my substrate like this as an enzyme, holding on my substrate and everything, right? But our product, let's say this is our product. Normally I am turning this into this, let's say. Okay, that's our product, okay? My enzyme is working on this. This is my product, right? We have a whole bunch of these. The cell's not using them now. They're backing up. The cell's not using them. Remember this story with arginine or whatever it was, right? We had a whole bunch of building up if the cell didn't use them. What did it do? It led to repression. That was on the genetic level, but this is gonna be on the protein level. So we have enough of this make, we've had enough of this made, it will come and bind somewhere else, let's say it's not on my side or something, and it causes me to change my shape. And now I can't interact with this anymore. So it's just causing this to change shape by binding somewhere else. Both of these are inhibitors, but one of them binds at the active site and the other is binding somewhere else preventing you from being able to use your substrate at that active site. Makes sense? So that's those, that's competitive versus non-competitive. There's pictures, if you're interested. I'm not gonna go over them right now. Um, all right, so we can't, like we already said, you can also repress or induce at the actual genetic level. I'm not gonna go over that because we did already kind of touch on that with the operons. Operons, again, multi-gene system, but you can still do it with just one gene in our cells. Okay. Uh, these are exergonic and endergonic reactions. I'm not really going to ask you about them, honestly, but just so that you're aware what the terms are. Exergonic, exo, giving out heat. Endergonic, 
endo giving in heat. I said giving in because that's how I think of it, but um, requiring heat to be put in. So you would be cold if you're doing a reaction that is endergonic. If you're exergonic, you're releasing energy, you would be hot reaction. Like anytime you add acid and water together, my dad, my dad taught me this thing. Everybody thought I was so stupid um, because I used to work in a biochem lab when I was in college, but He's like, yeah, you know, I remember from high school when I took chemistry and the professor used to say, do as you ought to, add acid to what to. <laughs> and that's what he would say. <laughs> but that's how I always remembered. You should always typically be adding acid to water. Um, there are very few occasions where you would do it the other way. Um, sulfuric acid is one of those that it'll get so freaking hot that there's like almost no controlling it, but it's ridiculous. But yeah, anyways, that made me think of that. Going back to our redox reactions. <laughs> remember Leo says GER. Losing electrons, oxidized. Gaining electrons, reduced. So we're going to come back into that here. You always have to have one donating an electron and one receiving it if you're having that, right? So our uh, oxidoreductases are going to be important for our NAD becoming NADH and our FAD becoming FADH2. But here, coming back to our ionic bonds, right? So this is why ionic bonds form between sodium and chloride. Look at this. Look at this, what's called the valence electron, right? That one on the outside. Uh, you think I would know chemistry or something. So on the outside here, we have this one. What it usually likes on the outside is, I'm sure you guys know this more than I do, eight. All right, over here, we have seven. Hmm, <laughs> starting to look a little bit suspicious, right? As to why these guys would want to be binding together. This guy wants to lose this electron. I don't need it on that outside orbital. This one wants to gain an electron because it does want to fill out that orbital. So it does that, it's exactly what it does. So that sodium lost its electron, lost electron, so it's oxidized. And because it lost an electron, it's still got the same number of protons, right? That didn't change, so now it's positive. So chlorine, it added an electron, so it's nice and happy out here. Now, because we have an extra electron added in there, but still the same number of protons as well, now it's got a negative charge. So we gained an electron here, so gained electron is reduced. Don't worry about what oxidizing agents are or what reducing agents are. That just makes it confusing. And I'm not gonna ask you about it on the test, okay? Oxidation and reduction, and whether something is oxidized or reduced, they're on the same pathway with one another. Let's just stay there, okay? Start going into the other stuff, you'll just get confused. I'm not even gonna touch it. All right, let's go. Um, electrons, basically electrons can be looked at as a form of energy um, and our ability to move them around within chemical reactions, we can use them as a source of energy to drive some of our reactions. That's really all this is talking about here. And that we do that in the form of hydrogens carrying their electrons. And so these are, this is gonna be dehydrogenation when we are removing that hydrogen with its electron and then putting it onto something else. Cool, so electrons in the form of hydrogens. So NAD, it's like nicotinamide something, and I can't remember what it stands for. It's like nicotinamide deaminase or something like this. I don't remember what. If you guys are interested, look it up, but I'm not going to ask you on the test, so don't worry about it. And I don't know what FAD even remotely is, okay? I used to know. I don't care now. So I get that luxury. <laughs> All right, so NAD, if you're going to reduce, so gain electrons reduced, um, it will become NADH. Sometimes it comes with an H plus along with it, depending on the chemical reaction that led to it. And sometimes it doesn't, it just depends. You don't have to worry about which one happens when. Lucky you. FAD, again, it says FADH, but it's actually FADH2, typically just a, um, mistyped in the slide. NADP is a thing down here as well. This is only gonna be important though for photosynthesis. And I'm never gonna ask you about it. All right, let's get into some catabolic pathways. Catabolic, again, cats are tearing things apart, so we're breaking things down. We're gonna be breaking things down in order to access their electrons and then use them to create energy. And that's what aerobic metabolism is gonna be. Um, and aerobic or anaerobic, it's just the difference between aerobic metabolism and anaerobic is the arrow part, whether you're having arrow or no arrow. Arrow is literally referring to air. So you can think of air, that's oxygen here, okay? So that's what we're referring to here. Aerobic involves oxygen. Anaerobic means without oxygen. 
It'll use any something else. It doesn't matter what, and you don't need to worry about what. It's just not oxygen. You do need to worry about that. ATP, in case you need a uh, refresher on this, this is a nitrogenous based adenine with a five carbon sugar ribose and three phosphate groups that are bulky and have a negative charge. They're gonna be repelling each other constantly. They don't wanna be bound to one another. And that's where the energy lies. It's potential energy. Potential energy, in case you don't remember, is energy that is stored within, it's waiting, right? It has potential to be released. So this pen, when I hold it up here, has potential energy. Why? It just released it. That was potential energy being released. So now it doesn't, it's sitting on the floor, it's got significantly less potential energy. Same thing in these bonds, they're just waiting to get released. They don't have to be near these repelled forces. So that's how they carry their energy. We can make our ATP, our energy, a couple of ways, three ways, not a couple, three ways. Substrate level phosphorylation, it's a fancy way of saying our substrate, um, we're, we're moving a phosphate from one thing onto ADP to make it ATP. That's all it is. So moving it. Substrate level phosphorylation. We also have oxidative phosphorylation. That's what we're going to be talking about in here. Um, anybody have physiology yet? Anybody talk about this in physiology? I'm about to go way farther in depth. <laughs> Apparently, I go farther in depth than um, anybody else does on this. I, I emailed my physiology. Yeah. Yeah. It'll. It, it's. Um. It's. It's not. I don't think it's as bad as it looks. And I don't need you guys to know the chemical equations. I think that's a load of crap. So we'll get into it. Oxygen. If you don't know what I'm talking about, y'all get fixing to know. Because it is gonna. You're gonna look at it and be like, oh shit. Like, what did I get into? Because you thought it was bad before. So, anyways, oxidative phosphorylation. You're gonna look at it, but I promise it's not gonna be as bad as it looks like. I promise. Okay. Oxidative phosphorylation using redox reactions to make ATP. So we're going to move electrons around and harness that energy. Photophosphorylation, easy enough, right? We're going to take energy from the sun and make it into ATP. Not, not doing questions because I just don't have the time right now. Okay, uh, so let's look at these three possible pathways you can go through. Aerobic respiration, and aerobic respiration, and fermentation, okay? We're going to touch on fermentation a little bit as we go through here. So we look at this. This is glycolysis is the way it was commonly used. It is, in fact, glycolysis is at our little pathway right here. Glycolysis is happening right here. Glycolysis is happening. And right here, glycolysis is happening. What is glycolysis? No worries. We're going to get into it. But basically, glycolysis is going from glucose to glyc. Glycose sounds like glucose. It is, in fact, sugar. Okay, so glucose, and we're going to be turning it into two pyruvates, basically. Turns out that uh, glucose is a six carbon molecule and pyruvate is a three. We're just basically splitting it up, right? Splitting it in half. It's essentially what it is. That's the main picture. The big picture, the whole like take home message of glycolysis is, is that, right? But it's not that simple. Um, we make some stuff in the meantime. Look out here. Remember how I said NADH is carrying electrons for us? That's important. We're going to need those suckers later, okay? So it's carrying an electron for us from that. We can also make some ATP from that. So when we look at aerobic versus anaerobic, these are the same. These are typically the same. So glycolysis is the same, that cycle called the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle, they're the same. And then uh, I'm guessing if you had Dr. Shearer as your uh, physiology professor, he called it citric acid cycle because it's really old school, okay? But <laughs> just saying. Anyways, uh, and these guys are not the same. They are different one important way. Here, this one uses oxygen and this one uses not oxygen. That's the difference. So um, looking over at fermentation, these guys though, they're different. They're just glycolysis and then that's it. And then their little pyruvate that they made as a, their uh, product and they had little electrons hanging out too. Wow, they made electrons and pyruvate, cool. Now what? They have to get rid of those electrons somehow. So uh, we change our pyruvate into things like ethanol or lactic acid 
or carbon dioxide and or, right? These sound familiar as far as fermentation goes because it should, right? If you drink beer, it's got ethanol in it, that's alcohol. It's got carbon dioxide in it, that's the bubbles in it. That's where this comes from. Lactic acid, you ever eaten yogurt and it's sour? Fermentation. You ever had um, kimchi or kombucha? That's the acid made from this, okay? So this is all fermentation. Fermentation is special because it's only done by facultative anaerobes. Don't worry about air tolerant. I'm not gonna ever ask you about it. Facultative anaerobes, they're facultative. They can go between the two types. So if there is O2 and it's available to them, then they will go through aerobic respiration. If y'all think this is not coming back, you're completely wrong. We're doing this like all in the lab too, so yeah. So, okay, so uh, oxygen's not available though. We don't have any O2, then we're gonna ferment. So we can make some energy, even if we don't have oxygen there to clean up the mess afterwards. I'll tell you what oxygen does in a little bit, no worries are that as well. But anyways, um, coming back to this picture, when you look at fermentation, look at how many ATP it makes. Wow, it's so special. It went through glycolysis and it made two ATP from one glucose. It's one glucose molecule made it two ATP when the one glucose, the same one glucose over here makes 38. So naturally it wants to go with oxygen if it can, all right? If you're a brewing person, if you're into brewing or you're interested in brewing, okay? You will grow your yeast under oxygen conditions so you have a good population, then you'll suck out the air in your system and force it to go through fermentation. But it's not gonna ferment much if it can't grow. And it's not gonna grow if it only has two ATPs for sugar, okay? So that's where that idea comes from. Cool stuff, right? You learned some things already about beer. And then, um, so aerobic respiration, let's do it. We'll start with glycolysis. This is how it starts. I told you glycolysis is gonna be our six carbon glucose, Yes, there's gonna be pictures and yes, it's gonna make you wish you were dead. Six carbon glucose to two times three of these, uh, three carbon, well, three carbon pyruvate. Okay, that's the big picture, okay? If you take anything out of glycolysis, it should be that. The pyruvate is extremely important here. It seems stupid because it's just a six carbon thing going to two, two, two three carbon things. So, so what, you just broke it apart, but it's extremely important that we get to that pyruvate and that we get there the way that we do, which is what I'm gonna show you. This is glycolysis. That's just glycolysis, y'all. So if you haven't taken <laughs> physiology and this is a new thing to you, sorry. You're gonna see this again probably. And I, and I think um, I think Dr. Shearer requires that you guys learn some of the chemistry stuff, but I don't know much about that. I used to know all the steps and where all the electrons went and everything like that. You guys do not have to know that in this class, okay? I want you to know that our one six carbon glucose, <laughs> this sounds like what I just said it is, exactly, makes two three carbon pyruvate or pyruvic acid in case you don't know in the body those can be interchangeable, okay? Okay, so here's our glucose up here. Here's our one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. If you wanna follow it through, you're more than welcome to. Mm -hmm. But we can see that there, these steps are happening for a reason, okay? To get things situated the way that they need to be. So we can make a little bit of electron carrier here. So we're carrying some electrons out of this. That's a pretty good deal. We have a little bit of ATP made along the way. That's not bad, right? We get something out of this on our way to basically splitting this in half, okay? So we get a little bit out of this. So here's what I would remember from glycolysis. From our one six carbon glucose to our two three carbon pyruvates, we also get some ATP. I'm not gonna ask you how much, but it's very little. Do know that it's little, okay? And we get some of these uh, electron carrier, okay? That's what I want you to know from this. Deal, we can live with that. Okay, so here's our pyruvic acid down here. You can see them, one, two, three carbon, and one, two, three carbon, okay? The next step that we're going into is the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle. And um, we're gonna use one pyruvate 
to go through it. So we can go through it twice if we have a glucose molecule, okay? Um, so here's our pyruvate and why it's kind of important. Pyruvic acid can be used by, of course, our uh, fermenters to make uh, these products, but also we got ATP along the way. Um, we can also use pyruvate to go into our Krebs cycle, but this can also be an intermediate that we can use to make things like uh, amino acids and nucleic acids and things like that. So it's important for a lot of reasons, but um, that would be our anabolic pathways, like it says up here. So it can go any of these ways. Useful, yes. But now I said how useful it is. So we went from our one, six carbon glucose, I'm just putting a glue from now on, I'm sick of writing it, into our two, three carbon pyruvates. Now these are going to be turned into two, two carbon, something called acetyl or acetyl, however you want to pronounce it. I always heard people say acetyl, a coenzyme A, but we'll put CoA. Okay. So, hmm. So each of our pyruvates lost a carbon in this process. Where did that carbon go? Like, what did it do? Like, did it do something in the, in the meantime? Did it, what happened? Well, we are going to make a little bit of this. We'll make one of these out of that. So that's nice. What's going to go into the Krebs cycle is this, by the way. That's why we're turning it into that. When we made that, remember we had an idea, just to summarize everything. And a little bit of ATP. Okay, so this is our summary of what we've gotten to at this point, all right? This carbon that we lost for each of these, the so two of these, okay, just give it off as CO2. We'll come back to it later, okay? Now we're gonna go into the Krebs cycle. We're gonna use that acetyl CoA. And the whole point of our Krebs cycle, we're gonna take that acetyl CoA and we're not gonna see anything carbon wise coming out of this as a product, okay? We're done with that. It's staying here, okay? Uh, not for us, not for our purpose. We'll lose them as some trash, some trash that we would call carbon dioxide. We'll lose them there, but we're not anything, we're not moving on with anything from that, okay? What are we moving on from uh, with this? We're gonna move on with NADHs, FADH2, uh, NADH here, NADH here. So the whole point of the Krebs cycle is taking the energy that's basically stored in the bonds of the acetyl-CoA, cycling it around, mo just moving bonds around. We're not even doing all that much here. We're moving the bonds around and stealing off the electrons as we're doing it. So as we're doing that, we will get more, an increase in our electron carriers. So increase in electrons. These will be our NADH2. I don't need you to know the numbers. Just know, need you to know that we're gonna make NADH and FADH2. Our byproducts, our byproduct that you might wanna know about, I would know that you do make CO2, sorry, CO2 here, okay? You do make a little bit of ATP here. These things get made in this process, sure, but this is the big goal for the Krebs cycle. So the big goal for glucose, for the big goal for the uh, glycolysis was to make pyruvate. The big goal for Krebs is to make these electron carriers, okay? So we've taken it really bite-sized here. Just so you know, citric acid is right here. That's why it's called the citric acid cycle. Okay, and we can count the carbons as we go through if you wanted to, cool. All right, so we're gonna move on to the electron transport chain. This is the show, okay? This is the big show. We made two little ATPs in our glycolysis. We made like, I think it's three or four ATPs. I don't even know, I'm not gonna ask you how many, that's how much I care, okay? A little bit of ATP in our um, Krebs cycle, right? Get ready, this is the big daddy, y'all. This is gonna be like, 34 ATP from just this, from those NADHs and FADH2s that you made along the way, that's where they're going, okay? So here's what it looks like. This, I love this so much, it's so cool. Again, I don't know why, oh man. 
Y'all don't love this when you leave here. I don't know what to tell you. So NADH carrying its little electrons, <laughs> carrying its little electrons. That's what that is, right? Our hydrogen with our electron will enter its electron into the electron transport chain, which is what this is. And our electron here, which is negatively charged, will move through these proteins in our electron transport chain. It's negatively charged. It's interacting with these proteins. They're getting excited, okay? They're changing their shape. They're doing stuff, right? They're getting excited from these electrons. So what they do is, because we gave off of our electron as an actual electron here, okay? These cytochromes, that's what they're called cytochromes, by the way, that's what the proteins are called. Um, anyways, your, their electron is actually as an electron. We gave it off of our hydrogen, it's not attached anymore. So now we have H pluses. We moved our electrons through here, or in the cytochromes. So the H pluses, because we're moving this negative across, our H pluses will be pushed out, okay? This process of why this is happening is called chemiosmosis, like this. Come on, dude. So that electron that's negative, moving across all of those cytochromes, whatever, causes these pluses, protons, to move out. And whatever. Yes? So like as, it, as the electron passes through, or is it the process of the pluses through, or is it after each? No, as it goes through, as it goes, yeah, yes. Um, we wouldn't know the difference because it'd be so fast, of course, but yes, as it goes through. That's a good question. So yeah, as it goes through and has those interactions, the hydrogens will be pumped across as we move, okay? So this is important. Those hydrogens are now outside of the membrane. That's a membrane, we can all agree with that, yes? That purple on the outside, y'all know what that is. That's a cell wall. That's a bacterial cell wall. That's our peptidoglycan cell wall of our gram positive. So this is happening on the actual membrane, that cytoplasmic membrane of the bacteria. So if this were a gram negative, we would have two membranes, right? The one that we're acting on here, and the one outside of the thing. We can agree with that as well. Now imagine that that gram negative is a mitochondria instead. So those inner membranes where we're having all this happen are all folded up in your mitochondria. Now you can see how it relates to a bacteria, yeah? So that's where it happens for us is on the inner membrane of our mitochondria, okay? So cool, so we can go back with this, with the concept of what's going on. We're shooting our negatives through. We're getting our positives out. We're building up all those positives and it becomes like a dam, okay? And the dam is holding back all of our positives. And we learned about diffusion, or we should have, because we definitely read chapter nine. We learned about uh, diffusion and gradients, and those are easy enough concepts anyways. So of course, the hydrogens want to equal out on both sides. If you had a big old pool and you put a line down in the middle of that pool and the hydrogens are on one side, they're gonna wanna equal out on each side, right? That's what they want to do. So we can't let that happen. But anyways, first of all, they want to go through. So we'll give them a little hole to go through, like a dam would. If you had a hydroelectric dam, you would have little motors that would get spun, and you can get the energy off of those things spun by the water going through. We're doing that here. The hydrogens are going to come through the only place that they can, which is ATP synthase. You guys remember about proteins and about hydrogen bonds and about how H pluses and can affect the structure of your proteins and all of this, right? As those H pluses move through that protein, ATP synthase, which is an enzyme, ACE, right? As it moves through there, it causes a change in it that basically powers ADP getting turned into ATP, okay? That's oxidative phosphorylation. We moved electrons and used the energy that we created from it by creating that gradient to drive ATP production. Okay, so that's how that works. And that collection of the hydrogens behind the mem on top of the membrane, you know, behind the dam wall, if you will, that's called the proton motive force. It has a name. So that's the proton motive force that we're creating. Problem though, right? There's a problem here. We need to have lots of H pluses out here. If it was equal, on both sides, but what the water was equal on both sides of that membrane, they're not gonna wanna move anymore. They're not gonna power ATP production, right? So we cannot let it equal out. We'll let a little bit in, 
but we have to get rid of the stuff that's coming in while it's coming in, right? So what we do is we take our little extra H pluses and we forgot all about our electrons, didn't we? You can't just let them fly off into the ether. You have to build, take care of those in order to keep them going through. So our electrons will take, uh, let's take two H pluses and two electrons. And let's take a half of an oxygen. And what does that make y'all? H2O, okay? So that is what we make to get rid of our hydrogens that are building up and to reset the electron part of it. So it doesn't get snagged up either. So now we can keep cranking through ATP synthase. So when I told you guys earlier on the semester, when I suffocate you with a pillow, when I suffocate you with a pillow, if you go swimming and you're holding your breath and you just feel like you really need to take a breath, and if you didn't, you would die, right? It doesn't take very long. That's this. That's because you can't take care of this. This part right here. If you don't have oxygen there, you can't reset that gradient. Your water will equal out on both sides and you won't make any ATP. Your body depends so heavily on that ATP that you die within minutes. That is impressive, right? That is how reliant your body is on these things. That's why you breathe in oxygen. That is the only reason why you breathe in oxygen right there, that one thing. All that hemoglobin we've been talking about, bringing that oxygen to the tissues is for this and only this. To come in and make water, okay? So that is uh, oxidative phosphorylation and aerobic respiration. It's aerobic because of the O2. You can see the ones next to it with whatever else, nitrate and sulfate or whatever for the other bacteria is. We don't care about them. Um, so real quick, so you breathe in your oxygen and what do we do with these carbon dioxides here? We get rid of them, we exhale them. So when we call it aerobic respiration, we ain't lying kids. You breathe in for making ATP in just, just in this, just in that, right? That's the only reason you're breathing in and the only reason you exhale carbon dioxide is at the Krebs cycle, as well as when we made acetyl-CoA. That's the only reason you exhale carbon dioxide. Your oxygens that are part of your carbon dioxide that you exhale did not come from the oxygen that you breathed in. It came from the food that you ate. Isn't that something? You're exhaling your food. You learned a thing. Tell me I didn't do it better than uh, Dr. Shear. I think I did. <laughs> I think this is so cool. I could just go on for it forever, but we don't have the time for that. So, um, so that's the coolest thing you've ever learned. And I know it is because I taught it. So um, <laughs> that's why I'm here y'all, even though like my back is hurting and I've got a fever and I'm sweating and all this, like I'm here because I love this and, and I like teaching in this part of it. So, um, so we learned about the proton mode of course and how protons are basically powering everything that we got here. We break it down. Glycolysis, 2 ATP. Krebs, 2 ATP per pyruvate. And then we got electron transport system, 34. We'll use up some in the middles as well, but like that's the idea. So we got ATPs in these. So that's what I would remember, right? Just to summarize this. One, six carbon glucose becomes two, three, carbon pyruvates or pyruvic acids, these guys will become two, two carbon acetyl-CoA, or whatever, you know what I mean. And then that's gonna go into Krebs. And that's gonna give us our electron carriers of NADH and FADH2. So the whole point of glycolysis, which is just this part here, is that, it's that, that's the point of it, okay? And uh, we did give off some ATP, whatever, and we gave a little bit of NADH. And here, this part gave off CO2 and some NADH. And then Krebs, is gonna give us a ton of NADH 
and FADH2. We'll also get a little bit of ATP and CO2, okay? But the whole point of these guys we just saw, right, is the electron transport chain to get all of that ATP, the 34 ATP out by pumping those electrons through from those guys, okay? So that's the big picture breakdown. I know it's a lot, but it's way less than what it could have been. <laughs> okay, so that's why our terminal step, the whole, this cannot continue if we do not have oxygen, right? For aerobic. So we also have different kinds of reduction in other organisms, fermentation, because we have electron buildup, we have to get rid of it somehow. So we put it back into pyruvate because we're not going past that. So there's a picture of that if you're interested. That's fermentation and why we make uh, alcohol or lactic acid. If you're breaking down lipids, here's the thing that is really terrifying, not really terrifying, but it's not good news, I guess. A six carbon fatty acid, we get 50 ATP compared to our six carbon sugar, which only gets 38. That's why your body stores energy as fat. It's more efficient that way. Also, it means that it takes a long time to burn through it. Like that has more calories per gram. Yes, mm -hmm. that's exactly why. And of course, oh, if you're looking at protein, protein takes almost it doesn't give you anywhere near as much energy. So you can get energy, it's just less. And so you know, then you end up not saving as much. You know, you get what I'm saying with the keto diet, right? That's basically what I'm talking about. Okay, so proteases are involved that can change your um, stuff, middle stuff, into other things. Cool. We can make things like intermediates. We can make things that are intermediate from uh, lipids or from proteins and have them enter into any part of glycolysis or Krebs or whatever it is. That's called amphibolism. Your ability to go back and forth and have intermediates from here or there and mix and match, that's amphibolism. That's all it is. It's a term that they gave it. They integrate with one another and work with one another as needed. Obviously, if you're going to be building cells, can make it, I can't believe I actually made it to this within time, well, roughly in time anyways. Anyways, you need to build cells, you need to build a whole lot of things, you need a lot of energy. But anyways, let's talk about photosynthesis for a second. Because you thought the human body was cool, you thought it was cool that me and we breathe in oxygen and all this. Let me tell you about some photosynthesis, okay? We have two types of reaction. The first one, the light dependent. We need light for this, okay? So we have to have sunlight, and these are energy producing. They're catabolic, okay? The other ones are like independent. We don't need light. So no lighting required here. And these are gonna build things, okay? Oh, geez. Um, basically what's gonna happen is similar to what we just talked about in the electron transport chain, light comes and excites a molecule that releases happy, energetic little electrons. What's this molecule called? Well, it's a pigment molecule, whatever it is, but in the, in, we're more familiar with it as chlorophyll. It could be other ones though. It excites it, we get electrons. And what does that electron do? It's gonna go down the, an electron transport chain and it's gonna pump out hydrogens uh, out here, right? Pluses and pluses, that's a plus for sure. And this is a plus and all this. Right, so we're gonna do all that. And then we're gonna go through the ATP synthase, ATP, yay. And then we're gonna make ATP and we're gonna um, make uh, and do all that. So this doesn't have to be taken care of the same way simply because we're exciting with the sun and we can kind of reuse this setup. However, it makes only a little. We can't power everything with that, okay? But we'll make some, all right? Great, we made ATP. Now we're gonna also breathe in carbon dioxide <laughs> as a plant, okay? Plants are gonna take in the carbon dioxide. They're gonna add in that little bit of ATP that they needed in order to make this Calvin cycle, which is the light independent cycle, light independent, okay? And we're just literally gonna build sugar out of carbon dioxide here and intermediates that we had, but those had to come from at some point, carbon dioxide. So this is how plants are gonna build their organic molecules. They use the energy from the sun to make ATP. Now the ATP is gonna power 
using carbon dioxide to make it into other carbon-based molecules because they don't get carbon, they don't get organic molecules from their diet or anything. They only make it. So now we're making all of our uh, organic molecules, but there's a lot of molecules that we got to make uh, with that carbon dioxide and that little bit of ATP, right? That ATP isn't going to power everything that we need to do. So where can we get more of that energy from? Well, guess why they make glucose? Please, please guess, because I'm going to tell you, they make glucose so they can put it through aerobic respiration. That is right. Y'all plants use oxygen. You learned a thing. I'm so happy to have helped you with it. <laughs> so yes, they literally do. So they use, they are going to use up more carbon dioxide um, than they are giving, you know, using up oxygen, right? I mean, you know what I'm saying? They're making more oxygen product than they're using back up through the system with aerobic respiration. And they're using a lot of carbon dioxide because they got to build a lot of organic molecules. But so it works out that they seem like they're just making oxygen, but they also use some oxygen too, because they do the same thing that we do. They're going to go through glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, the electron transport chain, and then take care of that mess with oxygen turning into water. That's what they're going to do. Um, they have mitochondria, just like you and I. Right? Okay, so that's the coolest thing you've learned ever. And that's it. And we're done. So let's go to lab. Guys, any questions for me, by the way? Yeah. Yes. <laughs>